Well, good morning, everyone. I appreciate you attending here this morning and welcome to the Dutchess County Regional Chamber of Commerce Not-for-Profit Seminar entitled Plan Giving. I want to take this opportunity to thank our presenter this morning, Sally Cross of the Community Foundations of the Hudson Valley. I want to thank you all for joining us, of course, here this morning. I also want to acknowledge our sponsors that are with us and thank them for underwriting this program today. Cindy M. Smith, CPA. Cindy Smith is with us along with from Thrivent Financial, Stephen Jones. Thank you both for your ongoing support of our programming. I would like to take the opportunity to call on each one of those individuals. While it's not in, in my script to do so, I do want to ask them to if they would take a few moments to introduce themselves and their organizations. Uh, so I'm gonna call upon first Cindy Smith from Cindy M. Smith CPA. Cindy, good morning. Good morning, Frank, and welcome everyone to this wonderful seminar. I'm sure you're all glad you don't have to go out in the cold today and are sitting in your comfy slippers. Um, change can be good. Um, and here at Cindy Smith CPA, we're known for stability, consistency, and our knowledge. Um, we remain stable as the rod for your accounting and tax needs. Feel comfortable making a change to Cindy Smith CPA as we have um, studied tremendously the new tax code and the CARES Act as I know that Stephen, Thrivent, and all the other professionals have done so, we are the premier provider of your CARES Act rebates. With respect to non-for-profits, I specialize in audit and control procedures for non-for-profits, and I welcome the opportunity to speak to you about your needs for audit. Audit is not a dirty word, um, audit is a, a good way to find out how well you are recording your transactions. Again, I welcome the opportunity to speak to you about our services for you. And thank you again to the Chamber for providing um, this wonderful seminar. I can't wait to hear what Sally has to say about planned giving. Thank you again. Thank you, Cindy. Cindy. <laughs> You're not aware was a, an auditor for our chamber foundation for many years and did a tremendous job at the time I sat on the finance committee and I want to thank Cindy for her continued support of our community and certainly the chamber and the chamber foundation. So thank you Cindy for being with us here this morning. And of course from Thrivent Financial we have with us Stephen Jones. Good morning Steve. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's my honor to uh, co-sponsor this with Cindy M. Smith. Uh, you may ask, who is Thrivent? Well, Thrivent is, we exist to help people achieve financial clarity. Further, we believe that money is a tool, not a goal in itself. Driven by a higher purpose at our core, we are committed to providing financial advice, investments, insurance, and generosity programs to help people make the most of all they've been given. At our heart, we're a membership membership owned fraternal organization, as well as a holistic financial services organization dedicated to serving the unique needs of our clients. We focus on their goals and priorities, guiding them towards financial choices to help them live the life they want to today and tomorrow. Now for me as a financial planner, I often meet people that have anxiety about planning for their retirement, even after saving for years. They're worried they don't know how to make it last for decades and mixed all the taxes and expensive health care that can eat it all away. So for over a decade, I've helped pl people plan retirements for hundreds of families. My relationship with them is built on trust and leads to wisdom and peace in their long run journey. My work enables them the freedom to enjoy the path toward and in retirement, blessing their loved ones and supporting and giving to the causes most important to them. And this freedom enables them to spontaneously give to organizations and causes as opportunities arises and intentionally in the near term. And last but not least, strategically plan with foundations like the Community Foundation for when they are called the final rest. So this is why I'm excited and proud to sponsor Sally Cross's presentation to us today. May it be a, a great experience for you. Thank you. And thank you, Steve. Both Cindy and Steve have been longtime supporters, as many of you may already know, of not only the Chamber, but the Not-for-Profit Committee and our presentations throughout the years. And I want to thank you both once again for your continued support. 
Now, these organizations have also stood by us, and I too would like to thank them for their continued support, specifically our corporate leaders of the Dutchess County Regional Chamber of Commerce, and that's Central Hudson Gas and Electric Corporation, Integrated Enterprise Solutions, Key Bank, and New Vance Health. And speaking of support, our chamber has created another way for our community to give exposure to our local businesses. That's shopthehudsonvalley.com if you're not aware. Visit the website shopthehudsonvalley.com. There's a lot of great deals and offers on there. It's a great way to show your support for our local businesses at a time when they need it the most and to think local first. Till now, our business directory has served as the most comprehensive resource and connection for our local businesses. Now with shopthehudsonvalley.com, businesses can gain additional publicity, both digital and in print, not just for the holiday season, but all throughout the entire year. We will be promoting this program. So shopthehudsonvalley.com allows businesses to place an exclusive discount deal or, or offer on the website. And in turn, the chamber will create this printed and distributed Shop the Hudson Valley Guide. We are working on our second issue now. So if you know someone that can take advantage of this, they want to put their offer in as soon as possible. And this is all at no cost to the member of business. The online version has metrics we can monitor and the chamber has also created an ad out of the offer that someone put places on the website and they can, we can use that then for paid social advertising. So there's quite a lot of bang for your buck considering it doesn't cost the organization anything and it's a great way to promote our local businesses here in our community. Again, all no cost to the member. We are now working on that guide. So as I mentioned, please, if you know someone, get that information out there. The, the initiative is powered by the Animal Farm Foundation, Atlas Star, Branding Pros, KeyBank, Prager Metis, Quality Environmental Solutions and Technologies, Riverside Bank, a division of Salisbury Bank and Trust Company, Stenger Diamond and Glass, TEG Federal Credit Union, and Ulster Savings Bank. And I want to thank them for stepping up to us, for allow us to help promote these local businesses. And to participate in the program, all you need to do is shop, go to shopthehudsonvalley.com for more information. We do have a couple of quick announcements for some upcoming events. I want to invite everyone to join us for the 14th annual Athena Awards on January the 28th at noon. Join us to celebrate this distinguished group of professionals who are making a real difference for women by providing guidance, mentorship, encouragement, and fostering women in the leadership positions all throughout our community. Once again, the date is January the 28th at noon. The event is completely complimentary and open to the public. And I want to thank our gold sponsors, Key Bank and Mid Hudson Regional Hospital, WMC Health. You may register for any of those upcoming events online at dcrcoc.org, Chamber's website, dcrcoc.org. We do still have some spots available. I want to take this opportunity to recognize the work of the not for profit committee of our chamber. They have been consistent and resolute with their programming despite the pandemic, they've been creative. Jennifer has done a tremendous job with her co-chair leading this committee. Each committee member volunteers their time to focus on supports for the not-for-profit community. And I think we can all agree they do a tremendous job for all of us. This time, I'd like to turn the program over to the co-chair of the not-for-profit committee from Northern Dutchess Symphony Orchestra, Jennifer Henyon. Jennifer, good morning. Thank you, Frank. Good morning and good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'll be kicking off the session very quickly, but we just have a few items that I'll run through very quickly because I know we're all excited to take advantage of Sally Cross's um, vast expertise in planned giving. So first about the nonprofit committee that Frank just mentioned. The committee is about providing resources and opportunities for people who are involved in the nonprofit world. And we really work to make sure that members are maximizing the benefit of being in the chamber and improving our effectiveness. And as you can see, we really have a community outreach as well to make sure that all nonprofits in the area are thriving, especially in these times. We really are a fun organization and it, it's a great networking opportunity. So if anyone is interested in the committee, please reach out to the chamber or myself and we'd love to give you more information on that. One quick housekeeping um, note, 
If everyone's able to put themselves on mute over the next minute or so before we start the presentation, we do want to make this as interactive as possible. But to start with, if we're all on mute, I think that will help us to get through a lot of the material up front. We do have the chat function open for people to put in questions or comments. And Gabriella Fryer, who is on the committee, is going to be monitoring that. And um, she or I might speak up periodically if there's a comment that we think Sally would want to know right away. Um, but if everyone mm -hmm. is able to go on mute until we open it for anyone who would like to ask questions out loud, we'd really appreciate it. And one last note, I just wanted to recognize all of the great committee members who are joining us today. So Stephen Jones and Cindy Smith are on the committee. So thank you for, for both being sponsors and being active members of our committee. And then we also have Gabriella Fryer, John Vaca, and if there's anyone else, you could unmute and um, just say, say your name and organization, because I know there are a few people on the phone, but they might not be committee members. Perfect. Then we have, we have a great showing from our committee, and I, with that, I'll introduce Sally. Sally Cross joined the Community Foundations of the Hudson Valley in May 2014. She was named president and CEO in June of last year. Sally works directly with active and prospective donors to encourage and facilitate current and future charitable legacies, which is really what she's going to be talking about today. Sally came to the Community Foundations from Montefiore Medical Center where she was director of major gifts and gift planning. Prior to that, she was director of development and alumni relations at SUNY New Paltz and executive director of the college's foundation from 2001 to 2012. Sally currently serves on the board of the Hudson Valley Land Trust, among other community activities. She is a sought after expert on planned giving I am, and I am very grateful for her partnership with the Chamber Nonprofit Committee today. Sally, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Frankie. Thank you all the members of the Nonprofit Committee for working with me and for um, inviting me to uh, join you this morning. I'm very excited to be here. Um, planned giving is something that's long been uh, close to my heart. Um, so. I'll get started. And please, if you have questions as you go along, if I use a term or a phrase that's unfamiliar, post it in the chat box. Gabriella will stop me and make me define things. Um, so grateful to have a colleague like her um, on the committee and, and working with us. Um, so I'm gonna start out by telling you a little bit about the Community Foundations of the Hudson Valley, although I suspect most of you um, have direct experience with us. We are a more than 50 years old community foundation um, and, a, and we are one of more than 800 um, independent, regionally focused public charities. So that's what the definition of a community foundation is. Uh, we bring together resources and expertise to respond to the changing needs of the community today and on a, a forever, basically. Uh, the Community Foundations of the Hudson Valley holds more than $80 million in charitable assets in more than 500 different funds. So these are people, families, and businesses that have stepped forward to invest in their community in a very significant way and to really, to you know, it's a, it's a great parallel with the Chamber, to invest their charity locally for the benefit of the local community. Um, how we work with our nonprofit partners. Again, I think most of you are familiar with the fact we offer competitive grants and we provide donor driven grants. And that's something that seems to be less known of, you know, of our $80 million in assets. The vast majority are actually held in either donor advised funds, which I'll talk about more later, or funds that have been established by generous donors to provide permanent support for organizations um, yeah, that they cherish. Um, we manage nonprofit endowment and reserve funds, including the chamber has a fund with us. Uh, we connect, we work very actively to connect donors with nonprofit organizations. We are a resource for many people to contact and say, you know, I'm really getting interested in youth after school activities, who's doing good work. So we really try and work and facilitate those connections uh, with, with generous people and the nonprofits in the community. 
We advise and educate staff and boards. Uh, we will come speak to your to staff and boards on various topics. And we provide um, a range of technical assistance ranging from one-on-one -on -one, uh, as, as groups in, um, enter their grant applications into our grant portal to sponsoring workshops and speaking engagements such as this. Um, so plan gifts, what am I gonna talk about? Uh, before I dive into the details of plan gifts, I wanted to give a little bit of a background or the landscape of giving in the United States these days. Um, over the past 10 years, the number of households giving to charity has been declining, which should be a, of concern to everyone. Um, some of this is really, frankly, directly tied to the income inequality that we've seen growing in the United States in the last decade and even before. Um, but also the uh, 2017 tax law really cut into the incentives uh, for many people to give a charitable deduction. Um, the, other, the other very important trend to be aware of is the aging of the baby boom generation. And I'll talk a little bit about all of these things as I go forward. Um, first, going back to the number of households, the number of households making any gift to charity is down. You know, 20% fewer in 2018 than in 2000. I will say a very positive, um, this is really weird to say, a positive outcome of the pandemic is that donors and small donors have really started, have really surged in 2020. So Americans, as they always do in a time of crisis, have stepped up in an amazing way. Um, so that said, 2018 to 2019, the number of households giving remained relatively flat. It's really seen an uptick in 2020. Um, I'm hopeful for, for every organization that has maybe brought back or acquired new donors as a result of the people feeling the need to step up and, and support their communities, that they're able to hold on to those donors. Um, which leads to the other very concerning trend, which is the donor retention of nonprofits is and continues to be very poor. So this is the number of donors that give to you one year that do not give to you the next, or you know, maybe within even the next couple of years. So there's a, you know, nonprofits are always struggling to raise money. And with poor donor retention, what you're doing is trying to raise money into a leaking bucket. Um, so that's, that's, that is a, a concern and ultimately will tie into the importance of plan gifts for your organization. A um, little bit more about the 2017 tax law, if you're not already familiar with it. Uh, it's the, it was passed in December, so it's on, you know, a few years ago now. By cutting the standard deduction, by increasing the standard deduction, it really reduced the number of people who could take advantage of the discount, the tax discount offered by charitable giving. And while that is never a primary driver for giving, it is an important consideration for, do for many donors, especially at the higher end. Um, I've had many calls over my career of donors who are sitting in there, literally calling me from their accountant's office and saying, my accountant now says it's good for me to give this much away, right? Um, so they're, they're looking at the, yeah, how the deduction can benefit them. You know, it, and then in addition, the 2017 Tax Act also put in what's called the SALT limitation which is uh, really, really, for those of us in New York and other um, high tax states, uh, by limiting the, the, um, the amount that you can deduct for state and local taxes, SALT, to $10,000, you've then created a real, um, not a real cliff, a real wall for donors to get over to be able to embrace the charitable um, discount. So what's, what's happening is that many donors are being um, really smart and planning their gifts for, for, to maximize their tax benefits and their impact. Um, just a second on the SALT limitation for anybody who may not be uh, aware of just sort of visually how it works. You know, the standard deduction in 2018 or 2017 was about 10,000 for individuals, 12,000 for a couple. So you had to have state, local taxes and charitable giving and maybe some medical or other expenses over that to be able to make itemizing uh, 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 mortgage uh, interest payments worth your, your, your while. Wow. Um, now, <clears throat> under the 2017 Tax Act, those standard deductions have been raised to 20 and 24,000, meaning as a donor said to me, um, this is somebody who's re you know, retired, older, paid off their house, so they've gotten a mortgage interest. So basically, 
after $10,000, which are my state and local taxes, I have to give $14,000 to charity this year in order to get a deduction. That's a big hurdle for a lot of households. Um, not insurmountable, but it's, it's one that's changed the way that people think about and plan for their giving. Um, so what does that all mean for you as a nonprofit trying to raise money? Those who are giving are changing the way that they're giving. You know, don't get me wrong when I say the number of households are giving us declining. America is still a very, very generous nation. This region is very, very generous. Um, a survey right after the tax act, well, about a year after, <clears throat> found that you know high net worth donors in particular, they did not change how much they gave, but they changed how they gave. And that can have a dramatic impact on your organization if you're not aware of how those changes may affect how you interact with someone. Uh, because that more than half reported that the tax law changed how they gave. So what can you do? Number one, don't ignore your most generous and loyal supporters. There are still about 13% of taxpayers who are itemizing every year, and you can increase your focus on planned gifts, both current and deferred, to try and bring in funds and, and continue the support from, or from people who've really, they've not stopped giving. They've stopped, they've stopped giving in the way that you may have normally expected from them. So planned gifts, what are they? Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit. So my, and now I'm going to move into the real planned gifts part. This is, you know, can you catch the wave of planned gifts that I think is just sweeping across the nation? A planned gift is a gift from a donor's assets. They're generally not cash. A planned gift can be current uh, from a stock, from a donor advised fund, from their individual retirement account. Or it can be deferred, which is often the only thing that people think about uh, for planned gifts, which is through a bequest or a beneficiary designation that takes effect is it, I'm trying to remember, Steve so beautifully phrased it, when you, <laughs> when you leave us behind, uh, or, or as we like to say in the industry, when, you're, when the gift is ready to mature. Um, and, you know, and the importance of planned gifts, and this is something to take back to your board, but given these changes in the United States, planned gifts represent about 20% of all giving in the course of a year. So you, there's really important for, for nonprofits to have a strategy to capture both of these types of gifts. Um, and that's probably an understatement. Um, but it also, as you'll see in a minute, about 10% comes from bequests and another 10% comes through donor advised funds. I don't want this in a different order. Look at this. Um, going back to the assets, um, this is why you're know, writing a check, cash is not always king. For most of your donors, the bulk of their assets are held in assets that are not in their checking account. They have to give it to you in another way. Um, and so I look at these 99% of, of a household's assets and say, that's where the money is. Um, come on, click. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about current planned gifts, why cash isn't always king. I'm hoping this, I was going to put a survey in here, but I was just not sure I could, <laughs> I, I was not sure I could manage it. Um, Stocks and other securities. I continue to be surprised at the number of nonprofits that don't actively solicit gifts of stock and then don't operate with a stock gift account. Believe me, for even a couple of gifts a year, the hassle of maintaining an account is worth it. Um, but they tend to be large gifts. Uh, you know, far be it for me to know anything about what drives the stock market, but the stock market has been doing really, really well lately. You have a lot of donors who are sitting on stocks that they may have bought five years ago, 10 years ago, even longer ago, that are worth a whole lot more now, they can make that gift to you and they can take the full value at the time of the gift as a deduction and they don't pay capital gains that they would if they sold it. Great thing. Um, real estate uh, other and other marketable assets. Um, this is an area where you do need to use some caution um, because there are many things, many things uh, what the IRS calls tangible personal property that can be donated, but you as a nonprofit only want to take it as long as you can readily sell it for, for and not have it be expensive, but it's still um, an important 
piece, um, including, uh, uh, you know, things that might surprise you. Uh, I was in a meeting with a board uh, last year before the pandemic and somebody listening to me talk about they were planning their endowment campaign sat up and go, the sky sits up and goes, so if I have a full length mink coat and there's a market for it, I could donate it and get a tax deduction. Well, that kind of got the attention of his fellow board members because he just didn't look like the kind of guy who rocked a mink coat. Um, but as it turns out, he was the executor of his aunt's estate and in among her possessions was a full length mink coat, which he was trying, which is apparently worth quite a lot of money and you can sell. Um, and, you know, he suddenly saw it in a new light as a, as a gift that he could make um, to the organization. Um, also very common, grants from donor advised funds. Uh, again, think about it. Has your organization, it almost certainly has received a grant from a fund at the community foundation that's not a competitive grant fund, a Schwab charitable, a, a Vanguard charitable, a Fidelity charitable donor advised fund. Those commercial donor advised funds are the largest in the world, country. Um, those are all gifts where the donors have put money into a charitable account to be invested and drive their giving. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about donor advised funds. Then the last one is um, IRA gifts. So donors over 70 and a half, there are some real tax advantages that I'll get into for them giving from their IRA rather than um, any of these other things that I've talked about. Sally, we have yes. a question. Yeah. Why would, why would the hassle of monitoring a stack donation be beneficial to a nonprofit organization? Because stock donations tend to be large. They tend to be individuals who've accumulated, you know, as I said, even, even a, a modest stock portfolio, if you as an individual have, have a shares of a stock, that have grown in value or appreciated and you sell those stocks, that sale is subject to capital gains tax. On the flip side, if you donate that stock, so say you, I'm just gonna use very round numbers. Say you bought a, a share of, shares of stock at $10 a piece and now they're worth 14. You bought a hundred shares, right? So that's $10,000 to $14,000. You could give five of those shares to an organization, not pay the capital gains and make a $7,000. You could give, of course give all 10 of those shares and not, so you get a larger tax deduction and you have some tax avoidance. Thank you, Gabriella. I was just about to say, can I, I can't believe nobody has any questions by now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so does that, I hope that answers the question. If not, um, let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll go more into it, but that's, and you know, this is really, something I'll say again later, in all of these cases, your donors are often being advised by their financial advisors. If they're not, I always encourage people to talk to them because the financial advisor know what is the best asset for them to give. And it's usually the checkbook is the, and cash is the last thing on the list. So, um, so, so. Okay, so. So you asked for them. We have another question. All right. Founda <laughs> Foundations have required minimum distributions. Do you think DAFs or donor advised funds should have this too? I hear about assets being quote unquote locked in DAFs. Good question. Um, there are people who make that charge. There is, so, so I would say no. Um, and I know there's a push on Capitol Hill to put in a minimum payout. Um, here's the reality. The required payout of a private foundation is 5%, and that can include some of your management costs. The average payout in donor advised funds from year to year ranges from 10 to over 20%. So by putting a minimum on, and, and, and it really as a condition of our having donor advised funds and being an accredited community, community foundation, we have to have an inactive fund policy. So we don't allow, and I think most, most uh, providers do not really allow funds to just sit there. The parking argument, nobody has ever prove, proven that with actual data. It's just an al allegation. Um, you know, what, what I see donor advised funds that used as, um, and what I personally use, my, my donor advised fund that I have at the community foundations for is it's a gift planning tool. 
So, so we have, you know, we have a lot of donors who come to us who have either had a very good year with their taxes or they've had a windfall event and they're facing a higher tax bill. And, you know, I, I hear things like, well, I'd love to give a larger, you know, like if I gave this all to my alma mater this year, they're going to expect that much next year. So I'm going to put this in my donor advised fund, increase my giving a bit from the fund, but I'm going to extend it out over several years. So get the tax advantage, allow them to really generously do their charitable work in the community. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a vehicle. It is really not a parking place. There is nobody... Uh, Professor Ray Madoff is the big proponent of this. She has never produced a shred of data that actually proves this. They seem to be mostly objecting to high-tech millionaires getting big tax deductions when they get a stock buyout. Well, that's that's our tax laws. That's not donor advised fund regulations. Um, so, so what we see, and this is this, and thank you, Gabrielle. And if there's follow-on, I'm happy to hear it is that donor advised funds are a perfect vehicle for somebody who wants to bunch, who wants to like gather up and do a big chunk in one year. You know, maybe it's 15 or 16,000 if you can swing that and then get the tax deduction and then even out there giving over time. Um, the other thing that we see is um, I, we've, we've had a few donors at the Community Foundation who are viewing, who are adding to their donor advised fund every year because it's going to be what keeps their giving level once they retire and no longer have the same income stream. So it's really a tax planning tool. It's not, I don't consider it a tax shelter. It, donor advised fund grants can only go to recognized charities. They have to go for a charitable purpose. Um, so they're basically saying, you know, this is not money I can use to buy myself a new tchotchke or a you know, big flat screen TV or something. It's, it's money that is dedicated to charity. Um, and they are growing very rapidly. And I think the tax, well, we saw in 2017 in particular, the tax law change drove a huge amount of activity towards donor advised funds, um, representing about 10% of all of the gifts, charitable gifts made in the country. Um, they're growing very rapidly. I mean, I, you know, I chose to open a donor advised fund in 2017, knowing that the odds that I'll be able to deduct taxes, uh, deduct charitable income gifts for years <clears throat> until it changes i can't um and uh and unfortunately i will say that the donor advised fund minimum at the community foundation is five thousand dollars and i had a mileage credit card this is when i thought mileage was a good thing to have on my credit card i can't really, really spend it right now uh, so i just plunked down that mileage credit card and opened donor advised fund um and it's you know i give out of both um personally and from my fund but it, it's it's been you know i got a nice tax deduction that year. Um, so, so I think donor advised funds are really important. And the other thing to know, especially if you get a grant from a donor advised fund at the Community Foundation, where we have, actually, I think we have almost 160 donor advised funds now. Those are holding $27 million. Um, and like I said, those all have to go out to charity. Um, you know, and, and last year in fiscal 2020, so <clears throat> the one that ended on June 30th, um, they made almost $2 million in grants and almost all of those funds stayed local. Um, so that is, don't, I almost kept it to put a slide in, but I couldn't find a way not to embarrass the charity. Do not send a longtime donor. You know, re remember to connect your donor to, your, to their donor advised fund. I just got a solicitation from a charity I've supported for about 15 years that showed my giving last year as a big goose egg because I gave to them out of my donor advised fund. That did not motivate me to send them more money this year, <laughs> right? Um, I'm still a donor. And in fact, in most cases, I'm not sure I would put myself in this category. There's always a donor. There's always, always, always a living donor behind a donor advised fund. You need to thank them. And every donor advised fund advisor should really be considered potentially either a major or a planned gift prospect or both for your organization, right? They have signaled that they're charitable. They have signaled that they're ready to put, you know, a not, a not tiny amount of assets aside for charity and that they make plans. Um, so we see an awful lot at the Community Foundation of organizations just sort of blowing off these grants as if they don't matter to the, either to the person who made them to a cause they support 
or to the organization. And I think that's a huge, huge mistake. Um, okay, so Sally, we have yes. a lot of questions about donor advised funds. The first one is, do you recommend we regularly reach out to our donors with DAFs and ask them to contribute to their favorite chat charity via their DAF? Um, if so, would this time of year be the best? Um, I think you know, any time of year, I mean, treat them as you would any good donor. Um, first place, put them in your database. And for those who do database stuff, soft credit it to their individual records so that when you look at their total giving, you see the, the totality of, of their, their generosity. Um, and yes, at, you know, the good thing, the, the good thing about donor advised funds is that, and, and it, there was a really hysterical post of one of the people I follow, which is like, you know, basically the blizzard of November to December solicitations just go right into the recycling because it's like, it doesn't matter. If the charity does something I think is lovely, I can make a grant any time of year, right? I've already gotten my tax deduction. And, you know, the sort of wall of, of year end emails. I mean, I used to get <laughs> the last couple of weeks of December, I get up in the morning and it's like, oh man, I'm just going to delete, 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 delete. Because I had my giving plan. I had my donor advised fund. Half of them were, you know, a significant number of them were telling me that they, I had not given yet this year. And it's like, yeah, actually I have. So um, I think really looking at your practices and how you treat those donor advice, you know, what they get invited to, what they get, how they get thanked, they should be thanked. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, you do not have to say, well, they're all going to make their gifts in November, December. You know, you have a good reason, you have a compelling reason, you have a compelling need. People with donor advice funds, you know, they're, they're, they're unhooked from that year end um, giving cycle to many degrees. And then our second question is, um, and I'm sure this is probably a question that all nonprofits on this call are, are asking, how do, how do we get our work in front of the Community Foundation of the Hudson Valley DAP holders? Two things. One, look at your records and see who's already given to you um, and stay in touch with them directly. Um, you know, like I said, there is always a donor behind a donor advised fund. Donor advised funds are allowed to make anonymous grants, but it's extremely rare. Um, and you can send, and actually Gabriella does this for us, you can send any acknowledgements, papers. If you don't, for some reason, have that donor's address, you can send it to us and we'll send it on to the donor. Um, so you can do that. The other thing is, for those of you who know your existing donor list, look at the list of donor advised fund names in our annual report. Most of them contain a family name. You know, if you can't, it's worth matching them up. Uh, very few of our donor advised funds have kind of mysterious names. And even the ones with, with sort of, you know, it's, it's not the Cross Han family fund, but it's, we have one called October birthday. Um, they're, they, we generally, are, they're generally comfortable with us letting the charity know who that is. So, uh, and, and those are, those are a very small minority of our funds. So you, if you have gotten, and again, Fidelity and Charitable include the name and often the address of the donor right on their transmittal like records. If you're not capturing that, if you're just, as one person said, grabbing the check and throwing the rest away, you are doing yourself a huge disfavor. Okay. Is that it? You're good now, to we're go. now we're going to turn to IRAs. Maybe some more questions. Um, so for quite a few years now, the IRS has allowed people over 70 and a half <clears throat> to make a distribution from their IRA, from their IRA directly to charity. They can do up to 100,000 a year, which is awesome. <clears throat> and why would somebody do that? <clears throat> well, the main reason is it's not, it, by doing that, that amount that you distributed is not taxable income to the donor. So that's number one. So that, and it, you know, it does not get them a charitable tax deduction, but in many cases, especially in New York, where you have the SALT limitation impacting deductibility. Um, the other thing for, for many are higher income, higher asset donors. It avoids also um, triggering more in the, in the uh, realm of um, income-based taxes such as Social Security and Medicare B premiums, uh, which 
you know, which again is another form of taxation if you're a higher income uh, tax. And, you know, the gift must, the, the uh, distribution that they make from their IRA must qualify for a full charitable distribution so, deduction. So they can't, even though they don't get one, they can't buy a gala ticket with that. Um, you know, so it's, it's got to be 100% deductible. They can't enter the golf tournament with that, but they can support any one of your programs and they can use it as they can donor advice funds to satisfy a legally binding pledge. So again, um, don't make a mistake of saying this is not a gift from the donor. This is a gift when you receive an IRA gift, that is a gift of that donor's assets. So treat it just as you would any other gift and any other gift level just you just don't send the tax. There is a there's a language that the IRS provides that is the preferred language to acknowledge it so that they can check the box on their tax forms. Cindy, Cindy and Steve probably know a lot more about this than I do, that says this part of my IRA that I took the money out of is not taxable. Um, so that is that is a gift from an IRA. Now, the reason that seven and a half <laughs> until the CARES Act, seven and a half was also when people had to start taking distributions from their IRAs called the Required Minimum Distribution or RMD. Um, the distribution still, you know, is, is viable between seven and a half. And now the CARES Act changed the minimum age to 72. So, so there's now a gap where they don't have to take it, but they can take it. There may be people with very large IRAs, which are, there are quite a few in this area apparently that it reduces the amount, so it reduces a future tax burden. Uh, that's getting probably way geekier than anybody needs to know, except people's financial advisors like Steve will know all this. Um, so this is why we should, should promote planned giving. So now I'm gonna talk a little more about what people mostly think of planned giving is, which is, um, uh, which is uh, the, the bequest, the deferred giving. Um, really common myth that I've, I've heard more than once uh, is that if, if we ask somebody to be, make a bequest gift or a planned gift and they tell us, then they're gonna stop making their annual gift. And actually just the opposite is true. Um, research shows that once a donor names your organization in their will or estate plan, they continue to support their nonprofit and they often increase their support. So, um, so think about this. Um, one, of, one of the things psychologically that people, um, that happens with people who go and make their estate plans, they put your organization in, they basically made you a member of their family. I mean, it is a big psychological commitment. Um, there are actually professors who study this, the, the brain psychology of planned giving. Um, planned gifts also because, deferred planned gifts, because you don't plan for them, because they just, they show up when those gifts mature, um, you know, they're not ones that you can really budget for easily, but they are, but they tend to be large and they are an absolutely great way to say, you know, we have a policy, we're just going to make that a reserve fund, an endowment, a rainy day fund, and really build up your organization's assets and future um, resilience in the face of economic turmoil. Um, plan gifts are Sorry. good. Yes. Sorry. Um, before you move on, we have a quick question going back to the IRAs. Um, question is, I imagine inherited IRAs, RMDs, can be used for charitable, charitable giving and avoid taxes? Um, I believe so, yes. Um, the, 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 there are some other changes that I'm, I'm really not the best qualified person to speak about that that other than spouses inherited IRAs are treated differently now and there's actually more so the ability to stretch the RMDs out over the lifetime has gotten very difficult. And that is a whole that's not something I'm qualified to get into. I mean, I understand it, but I yeah. So but yes. Um, and, and and inheritors other than a surviving spouse often face a larger tax burden because they have accelerated payouts. You know, as all of this stuff is being negotiated in Congress with the Treasury Department, the Treasury Department, a little history here, allowed pre-tax contributions to IRAs on the theory, the economic theory, that they were going to be invested and grow and that they're going to collect the tax on the back end. So every time they do these charitable 
carve outs for IRAs. Treasury is like you know, standing somewhere in the background going, our taxes aren't going to be what we planned for. Um, and there's, that's always the balance. That's, that's been the balance of the trade off of some of these um, you know, developments. Thank so, you. And thank you. Thank you for asking that. And thank you for keeping me from getting too geeky. Um, bequests, why do they matter? It's a lot of money. Um, it's about 10% of all charitable gifts. It bobbles between nine point something and 11 every year. Again, we don't absolutely control these things. Um, so it's a lot of money. Yeah, I don't think you should overlook it. It is often the largest gift that a person makes in their lifetime. Um, the average charitable bequest, I think last year was about $70,000. So that's real money. You know, again, a bequest is an asset. It's, a, it's an asset that somebody can leave all or part of the proceeds of to your organization when they don't need it. Think about houses. Think about what a house cost J just by itself. I mean, a lot of the charitable bequests that we have received that I've received throughout my career are fueled in large part by the sale of a residence from somebody who passed. Um, so they're, they're, in addition to the fact that once somebody puts you in their will, they become a really committed annual donor. Um, it's a lot of money when they do pass on. And I will note that every year bequests are about double what corporations give and, you know, in the same ballpark as foundations. I will also point out that that's 17% of foundations, which has been going up, that includes donor advised fund grants. Um, about 5% of that is donor advised fund grants. So again, the, the 20% of the, you know, the 15 to 20% of the giving every year that could be coming, some of which to your organization is, uh, is held in bequests. And why are we not advancing? Um, the other feature thing driving bequests is I think probably everybody's heard about the great intergenerational transfer of wealth. Um, this was first talked about some years ago. There was a study by two academics in Boston College who looked at the aging, looked at the impact of the aging and passing on of both the greatest generation and the boomers generation uh, on uh, wealth transfer. So we are in the midst right now of the greatest transfer of wealth from one generation to the next that the world has ever seen. Um, though these are, these are, generational cohorts that have done well. Um, the Community Foundation, after this study initially came out, um, commissioned a more focused look at the Hudson Valley. Um, and it, it estimated that about $74 billion was going to change hands over that 30 year period. So about until about 2025 um, in the Hudson Valley. Now, most of that's gonna go to family members. Some of that in a few cases will go to taxes, depending on what they do with the estate uh, tax. All right, now very, very, very few people in the Hudson Valley will pay a state tax. But some of it, five to 10%, can and should go to charity. And you know, our job at the Community Foundation uh, you know, is to really help make sure that some of that charity stays local, as much as possible, frankly, stays local. I have nothing against national organizations, but we're a locally fo focused organization. Um, and smaller estates. Um, so if you think, well, well, I don't have any Warren Buffetts living here. Um, smaller estates are actually growing the charitable bequest, bequest pipeline uh, more than the larger ones. So Sally, we have a question. Sure. When asking for a bequest, you're acknowledging death. How do you gently respect what might be an emotional issue? <laughs> that is a great question and it is a very challenging one. Um, I think first place, it's, it's the better you know your donors, the more comfortable that conversation is. It, uh, it, for me, usually comes up in the context of overall gift planning. Um, and there are ways, and I'll talk about this a little bit at the end, of really a lot of what you want to do with bequest marketing is background drip marketing, just making people aware on a regular basis that they know about your organization. Um, but you, if you're in conversations with somebody uh, about a major gift, um, which does require that you know them and be in conversation with them. A planned gift conversation can be a really natural slide to, you know, oh, I'd love to make, you know, a big commitment to this campaign. I'm just not sure I can do it right now. You know, multiple, and then you, then it's easier to introduce the, well, could it be part of, can some of this be part of your legacy plan? 
so yeah, you're right. You don't usually say, so when you die, are you going to leave some money to us? <laughs> um, and the other thing is that a good attorney, when somebody is sitting down and doing their estate planning, uh, will ask that question. And again, you have to be enough in their mind as somebody who welcomes bequests to be able to say, because you know, I don't know what your experience is. I think most people get to the attorney's office, they're doing their estate plan. They're talking about all this heavy stuff, death and who gets my assets and blah, blah, blah. And when it gets to the charitable question, there's often a deer in the headlights moment, right? You're just not, if you didn't come in with that in mind immediately, what are you gonna think about? American Cancer Society, Lung Association, like the big names that are always in your head. Again, nothing wrong with them, but if they don't know that your organization um, accepts bequests, welcomes bequests, they may not even think of it. Um, I, I had the experience, my colleague and I had the experience not that long ago, but pre-pandemic, of having this conversation with a board of directors. Uh, we've been brought in by the, the CEO to, to talk to them about planned giving and legacy societies and legacy giving. And I said, you know, that's really important. And it, of course, can start with you as members of the board, as leaders of the organization. You can make a plan in your legacy plans to support this organization. So here I am sitting with a board of like 10 people. Two of them raised their hands and said it never occurred to them that they could leave a planned gift to this organization. That's what I mean about awareness. And, and, and you know, it was like, I was like, I can't make this up. <laughs> and then the best part was that one actually had an appointment with her attorney the next morning. So I just I said, well, you, you're the first two members of the like, of whatever you call this organization's legacy society. And they, in fact, um, stepped ahead and became that. So, um, so who are your most likely bequest donors? And again, think about your database, think about your donors. You, you no doubt have some or many of these people, depending on the type of organization you are, in your uh, donor lists already. They're 80 years or older. They don't have children. They're often highly educated and just demographically, mostly it's women. Uh, we the, just, just mortality rates in the United States, we end up with most of the assets. So um, the other piece that I see, I'm seeing a little bit more of as the boomers are aging and making their plans is my kids have everything they need. We got them really set, well set up yeah, I have kids, but they're, they're, they're on their own. They're taken care of. They're doing well. So, you know, kids, you know, so that, so that is this, these, these statistics of the most likely to bequest donors, I think will be changing over time a little bit. Um, and just again, to go to the marketing aspects, most organizations donors are for the most part older. That's just a demographic timeline, right? Your kids are grown up if you had them. Your house is paid off or your mortgage is paid down. You, you know, you're set up well, you're thinking, you start to think about your legacy, you know, your, what, 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 what your story in the world is. Um, and you have disposal, more disposable income than somebody in their thirties who maybe is you know, paying for their house, paying for their college loans and raising kids. So it's just it's just a um, it's just a demographic fact. Um, so we do have one more question. Sure. Um, and this question may actually be um, more for for Steve or Cindy um, than you, but um, actually that's that's what the person who's asking the question said. Um, my organization is trying to connect with local financial advisors to keep us in the top of their minds when discussing plant giving to their clients. In your opinion, is this angle worthwhile? Also, are there laws that preclude financial advisors from making recommendations? Steve, uh, Cindy, do you, either one of you take, Steve, would you take that one on? I'd love to. I mean, it's an integral part of my practice of knowing who my clients are and how much generosity is important to them. Um, so it's not against the law at all. In a fiduciary relationship in financial planning, I can't recommend specific products, or I certainly wouldn't recommend certain charities or foundations, but I certainly would introduce them, whether it be the community foundations or other ones, and this is a great way to do plan giving. So hopefully that addresses the question. Yeah, and, and I often find that, you know, when the advisor is directing us to a, an individual, it's because they say, well, I support such and such every year. I support Duchess Outreach. I support, you know, 
so that so that they're not the advisor is not making the recommendation. They're just building on what the, the client is already doing and, and helping them say, you know, I'd like to continue this past my lifetime. This this can be part of my legacy. Um, so as we talk about bequest giving and planned giving, we have to talk about the boomers. Um, they are, we are here. Um, we're getting older. The first boomers turned 70 in 2016. Remember that 70 and a half mark? Um, and then 72. Um, and about 2 million a year, every year for the next 13 years. Um, and they are, you know, they are already retired or retiring or thinking of leaving the workforce. So a lot is going to change in their lives and including, um, including how they give. Um, and the baby boomers, this is, uh, I just got this from the Federal Reserve. The baby boomers have a disproportionate net wealth um, in, in this country. So if you look at the first, the red block, that's the silent generation. Those are the over 80 who are passing already. They're you know, World War II. The baby boom came of age, were born, came of age post-war, the boom, especially if you're a white male, a lot of assets, a lot of um, uh, government support to build up your personal wealth. Eventually that will go somewhere. They, that is 53% of net assets in the United States are controlled by baby boomers. That's huge. And we have a lot of baby boomers in the Hudson Valley. Um, and they're not going to give quite like their parents give. I love this slide because like not this year, but last year I was at the New Orleans Heritage and Jazz Festival, which I go down to every year when it's held. Um, and uh, here is AARP. Um, they've set up a wine bar and new music venue on the <laughs> grounds of the Jazz Fest because um, you're going to appeal to boomers a little differently than maybe you did to the silent generation. They're just not likely to give or plan their gifts in the same way. They want a fair amount of control. They want personal attention. All of those various studies you read about, you know, kind of how the baby boomers change and have impacted giving um, it, it are true into and through their estate plans. Um, and estate planning is booming. Uh, I, again, I don't know how, you know, Cindy and Steve have, um, experienced it, but every estate planning attorney I know, and certainly we at the community foundations have been um, really experiencing an uptick in people making, finalizing, updating, realizing we're in the midst of a pandemic that their charitable plan is outdated. Um, and so, and it's, you know, it's also reflective of the population demographics in the Hudson Valley, where about a third of our residents are over 55. You kind of have to, mortality starts to seep in. Um, and click the right button. Um, I found this slide. I just kind of like it because it's hysterical. It's really people sitting at home, especially during the lockdown, during the pandemic, were experiencing what one professor called a high level of mortality salience, meaning, yeah, you know, kind of death is happening. So, but, um, that, has driven a lot of estate plans. And again, I don't know, Steve and Cindy, if you've seen a similar uptick, but I, I know that we have and a lot of attorneys I know have. Um, so this is something we've started to touch on. How can your organization catch the coming bequest and planned giving waves? You really need to get started or move on from where you're at. Um, I, um, I know that some organizations in the Hudson Valley have done a really good job promoting planned giving. I also know because we get mail from all of you um, that a lot have not really stepped into that and embraced that aspect of their giving. It's, it's, I understand you know, it's longer term. It's harder to quantify than say a golf tournament or a gala, but in the end, I promise you it's worth it. <laughs> so how do you get started? You just need to know the basic types. I've gone through them today. They're not complicated. Um, if you forget after this, you know, 10 minutes after I'm done and you want to refresher, we're happy to talk. Um, um, I will, now I should at the end, I'll do this at the end, introduce my new uh, colleague, Serena Marrero, who is our new director of planned giving, who's also here to assist you. Uh, again, just the basic types, the current and, uh, and deferred, that they're non-cash assets. So don't be freaked out when somebody starts talking to you about, you know, a house or something like that. 
um, you know, they remember that, remember that when you're having a major gift conversation, when you're having a gift planning conversation with donors, which does mean you need to talk to them, um, that you, you have to be willing to think about all of their assets as they bring them up. I mean, obviously you as a nonprofit don't know, but I think having a donor understand that you're open to this, that you're open to receiving or being uh, the beneficiary of the proceeds from a non-cash asset really helps expand their mind about what's possible in terms of supporting your organizations. But bequests are gonna be the most common. And then a second uh, deferred plan gift uh, are um, beneficiary designations. So increasingly, if you have an IRA, if you have an IRA, if you have a bank account, you have a life insurance policy, those all have a beneficiary designation on them. More and more people are using those to transfer assets, all or in part directly to charity or family members or other recipients. Um, the bequest is so so it's a pretty straightforward process. The thing that you know, need to know is that is um, not necessarily through a will or a trust. I'm sorry, I got, I got behind it. So <clears throat> the quest through a will or a trust, beneficiary designations. You know, so I can make a will, but if I don't change my beneficiary designations, there's no, you know, that it had, the two have nothing to do with each other. Um, most common beneficiary designations that a charity receives would be a life insurance policy proceed, part or all of, of a life insurance policy can be paid to charity. Um, retirement plans, obviously we've talked about IRAs. This was new to me just last year. Um, HSAs, which are individuals that have health savings accounts to cover their out of pocket on high deductible health care. Apparently these, some people have accumulated quite a bit of money in these and they can be inherited or passed on or designated. Um, and bank accounts, you know, sometimes, sometimes your plan gift is pretty modest, but it's whatever balance somebody had in their savings account, um, because all of that has beneficiary designations. And as I mentioned earlier, tangible personal property, um, you know, the house, a stamp or coin collection, you know, anything that can be sold. Here's the basic language for bequest. Um, if you don't have this on your website, if this is not available to your donors, it's the first thing I would say, other than saying, other than indicating that you accept plan gifts, like having a header for plan gifts, put this language in there. Very, very important to have your tax ID number as part of that. Um, uh, you know, an attorney told me early on in my time at the Community Foundation, I don't want to bill a client for looking for your tax ID number on the IRS website. It's not a secret. It's not like your social security number make it ever we have it on our business cards at the at the community foundation so that if somebody calls me and says i'm updating my ira what's your tax id number i can give it to them um i keep clicking the wrong button um donors can also leave uh you know the, the des beneficiary designations which i mentioned earlier that that means they don't have to go and change their will so they can update these and leave your organization in their estate plans, it's part and parcel of the estate plans, but it's not governed by the will. It doesn't go through probate, which is not a process I'm going to get into. Um, but it, but it can benefit your organization. I, oh, <laughs> let's go back. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, slideshow from current slide. There we go. Um, Plan gifts, where do you find them? There, there we go. Beneficiary designations, they're donors who are already in your database, right? Don't, you don't need to do a big public campaign for plan gifts. They're, um, they're already there. They've already committed to your organization. They may or may not have uh, made or updated their estate plans or ever even thought about you in that context. Um, you know, it's your volunteers, it's your board, it's people who've made three or more gifts to your organization of any size in the last five years. Um, you, you know, they have committed to your organization. Um, you know, the animal shelters are just notorious for getting these very generous planned gifts from, you know, the widow who got their last pet 
there's a rescue from the animal shelter. And then all of a sudden they've got, you know, a six figure gift coming in. Cause it was, it was, uh, you know, it, it's something that really made a difference in their lives. Plan giving is not complicated. You don't need a plan gift person on staff unless you're a large organization. It's probably not worth the expense. Um, and don't worry about the planned gift unicorns. They're out there. They're wonderful. They're pretty rare. Um, but I've had more than one staff person at nonprofit say, well, we can't do planned gifts because I don't know how to do a crut. And it's like, you don't ever want to do a crut. You want a good attorney who knows what they're doing and a good financial manager, advisor, trust department doing the crut for your donor to benefit your organizations or any of these other um, alphabet soups um, that, that and, and like I said, they're not a lot of them. They're big, they're substantial, and they're wonderful. We, we are the beneficiary of several of the community foundations, but they're just not something you're ever going to do as a nonprofit. That's something that's going to come up in conversation with the donor as they're making plans, usually after, often after a large taxable gift event. Um, so how can you get started? If you're not already started, get your board buy-in that you're going to be talking about this. That's really important. Um, you know, and, and, and frankly, the board should be considering themselves as the first members of any sort of legacy society that you create to acknowledge and recognize. So again, what you're doing is creating a sense of this is what people do with our organization. You know, we have 60 or 70 members named and a, another 40 or so not named anonymous in our legacy society at the community foundations. So it's really an important tool to remind people about estate planning gifts. Get to know about the basics, update your gift acceptance policies if you need to. Again, um, th those are very helpful just if you get offered an asset that, that is really not marketable. Um, but it's, it's, you know, so, so just really some simple steps, most of which your organization should already be there, if not get there as soon as you can. Um, mark it with what you have. You don't need to create a lot of literature. We don't have control over when our donors go to their attorneys, update or make their estate plans. We just need to be in their minds, sort of in their, you know, their consciousness as a potential recipient. Um, and then I, I keep coming back to when you're having conversations with your donors, this does need, estate gifts most likely to come, frankly, to organizations that have good contact and communications with their donors. Um, you know, people, you know, again, they put you in their estate plan, they're making you part of their family. Think about that. Think about what your major donors are doing when they make a, and a major, major or regular donors when they commit to your organization's mission. Um, and keep great records. You know, ask your board to become the first society of the legacy member, first members of the legacy society. And please name it something more original than the legacy society. That's something that ties to your organization. Um, and then recognize and steward those donors um, because they they can put you in, they can also take you out. That's all I have. Um, and I'm happy to take more questions. I've loved the ones that we've gotten as we've gone along. Thank you. I put you all to sleep. We do have some questions coming Hi. in, and as Gab Gabrielle Sorry. is about to report on them, um, but if anyone prefers to do their questions verbally, you could you could either just speak up after Gabriella covers the questions in the chat box, or you could put put in chat that you have a question and and we'll call right. on you, whichever you prefer. Gabriella. Okay, so question is: If we are a new nonprofit organization, a new initiative without um, a great donor base. How can we build that donor list? Ask people to give. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really actually not being flippant. I mean, you know, are your new organization, you have a new maybe board group of committed volunteers. Who do they know who share their passion for this mission, for this cause? That's where, that's where you start to build your donor base, right? And then, you know, if you, you you can share information about it, invite them to join you as a supporter. Um, yeah. 
it's that simple. I think also, you know, social social media is is a great venue for nonprofits to um, get what they're doing, who they're serving out there. And it's by promoting your work as a nonprofit that you'll you'll find people who um, who believe in what you're doing, support what you're doing, and uh, and want to financially support what you're doing. So you know, don't be afraid of using social media. Yeah, and I want um, I want you know, stand out to your donors a little bit. Um, I, we've been I'm on the board as as uh, was mentioned in the introduction of the Wallkill Valley Land Trust, small organization, two person organization. And I convinced the board to, um, and I will introduce Serena next, to start making thank you calls for gifts to people they knew or people they thought they knew. And there was, it took a while. The board was terrified. Um, you know, my fellow board members were, you know, the first time I suggested it, they kind of looked at me like, we brought this person on the board for God's sakes. They had lovely conversations. They were surprised that anybody called and said, thank you for the gift. By doing things like that, and I've made a lot of thank you calls for the community foundations, you're repositioning your organization in a donor's mind. And it is so easy. It is often, you know, often you leave a voicemail or you shoot them an email because you don't have a phone number. But do something other than just that rant, rant, standard thank you coming two and a half, three weeks or months after the gift. Do something to stand out to your donors to say, yeah, this is an organization that values me and I value the mission. So, so one last question is, what other planned gifts do not require changes to one's will? Anything that has a beneficiary designation on it. Um, now, now in New York, it cannot be a residence, um, which it can in some states. Um, so it is any bank account, brokerage account, life insurance policy, um, this health savings accounts, um, you know, certainly retirement accounts. And again, it, and it doesn't have to be 100%. That's the thing that you, the donors probably know, but you can allocate percents. So they can say 10% of my life insurance policy or 10% of my IRA goes to this organization, or they can make a list. So, and those can be updated and changed at any time. The forms are usually on the uh, provider's website. So um, uh, here's a question. How can you ask for money? Members are loath to quote unquote beg. It ain't begging. Okay. You're asking, you're asking them to join you in, in accomplishing the mission of your nonprofit, right? you I mean, it is, if, if you consider it begging, it, that means you're not, I mean, to me, it's like that really starts with your attitude towards the nonprofit. Um, I would find it, you know, I would find it very hard to ask for a nonprofit whose mission I did not support wholeheartedly and personally. Um, it's easy if it's a cause you believe in. And, and it's, you know, you're just asking them to, to join you in, you know, so if you believe that, oh, oh, <laughs> I'm going to pick on Marsha in the Rosendale Theater. If you believe that the, the Rosendale Theater is really the heart of Rosendale and an important cultural institution in our region, it should not be hard for you to say, join me in helping make sure that they can accomplish this mission. You're going to make a difference. I mean, that's what don you know, donors, donors get a psychic return from making a gift. They, you know, they're investing in a mission that they believe in. Um, so, so I would not be afraid of begging. Uh, I would not even ever consider it begging. Um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, I, I, I could, I can sort of see that on the faces of people who used to solicit Girl Scout cookie sales <laughs> for their kids. <laughs> I, you know, that's, that's not fundraising though. <laughs> it may be revenue raising, that ain't fundraising. Thank uh, you. So it has to be passion driven. Absolutely, or at least commitment. Or even if it's, you know, I, I guess you could be committed without being passionate. Okay. Um, Thank you so some much. People can. I, um, and if there aren't other questions, and I saw Cindy posted something, I also would like to introduce uh, Serena so that you all uh, um, can meet her if you haven't. Serena Marrero, you want to say a few words? Sure. Hi, everybody. It's good to see some uh, faces that I haven't seen in a long time and some new ones. So I am the director of plan giving with the Community Foundations of the Hudson Valley. I started about a month ago and uh, very happy to be here. You know, I have a long history of working with 
uh, many of you in the nonprofits in the Hudson Valley and uh, just love to be able to help everyone and our, and our donors, financial advisors, uh, and CPAs and all that facilitate plan gifts to uh, ultimately to improve our beautiful Hudson Valley community. So here for you at any time to speak with your boards or help, uh, help the nonprofits with their planned uh, giving uh, activities and, um, and donor advised funds, all of that. So look forward to speaking more with all of you. Thank you. And for those who, um, who may not be watching the chat, um, Cindy and Steve and Serena have all put their contact information into the chat box so that if you have any questions after today's presentation, you can certainly reach out to them um, for additional and specific information. Thank you, Steve, Cindy, and Serena. Perfect. Gabriella, have we covered all of the questions? I believe we have. We have. Perfect. Um, Go ahead. Oh, I see, I see another question, I believe. Yeah, hi, Martha. Oh. Um, okay. DAFs can, um, so yes, that can DAFs have instructions for uh, what happens after their death. Yes, and so one of two things can happen. Either the DAF can, the do donor advisor to the fund can name a successor advisor. So often that's children. Um, you know, so ma many look at it as a way of fostering a, a sort of multi-generational family giving, um, which is great. Um, and the other, and sometimes they involve them during their lifetimes and it just remains with them. The other one is um, they can designate certain organizations. So we have a number of DAFs already who say, when I pass, these are the organizations I'm supporting. And um, you know, it's, it's in this case, then the invested income every year is made usually by percentages to the organizations that they name. So it is an, you're right, it's an important designate, beneficiary designation that I hadn't mentioned, I should have. And then Cindy, I saw something posting about um, telling your organization. Yes, Cindy uh, posted, it is important for the donor to inform the nonprofit organization that there has been a planned giving. We accountants may be able to record the gift sooner than later. This may inspire other potential donors to give. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, and, and I know at least at the Community Foundation and most organizations, you can still, you can tell an organization and you don't have to be listed if you don't want to. Some people definitely prefer to remain anonymous. So if you see like our legacy society is like anonymous and it's, I can't remember, 26 or whatever. Um, but so that you know, because it is also, um, it's, it's helpful and also know that a significant percentage of donors never let the charity know. Um, you know, including some who have made plans with us, they're like, well, I might change my mind. Okay. So, um, so that's, you, you have to be aware, especially when you're talking to your board and um, sometimes board members feel like it takes too much away for not enough of a certain and short-term return that generally speaking, a third to a half of the people who have put you in their estate plans, once you start marketing, we're never going to tell you, you're not going to find out until unfortunately it's too late to thank them. Which I would just add is is uh, a good case for having some sort of recognition uh, system like a legacy society because that gives them an opportunity to step up and and the more you engage them in that the more there's the social interaction they they uh, they'll they'll like that and they're more likely mm -hmm. to let you know this maybe even more specifics about what uh, sort of the quest that they've they've uh, you know, included in their plans. Yeah, yeah. It also performs the function of what um, what uh, researchers call uh, um, uh, social norming, right? People mm -hmm. like me do yeah. this um, with this group. So that's um, you know, it's it's peer pressure basically. <laughs> but if you're in academia, you'll call it social norming. We call it stewarding. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So we'll continue to monitor the chat box in case there are additional questions, but I'll start closing out our session with a few points of gratitude and then I'll turn it over to Rich Kleban at the chamber. So Gabriella, feel free to jump in if you do see 
someone um, post a question. But we again in the in the chat box, we really appreciate any feedback you have. We're not doing a survey like we did when we used to do these seminars in person. So any feedback you have um, really helps the committee in our future planning. So first, thank you so much, Sally. You are truly an expert in this subject and we were very lucky to get to spend this past hour and a half with you. Um, thank you again for sharing your expertise and really teaching a lot of us some of the ins and outs that we probably haven't um, had direct exposure to before. I definitely learned a lot and I appreciate your partnership today. Gabriella, thank you so much for monitoring the chat box and making sure that this was an interactive session, which again, our committee really wants to interact with the group to make sure that everyone gets something out of the seminar. And our, our committee, as I mentioned, we're always looking for new members, um, but I wanted to take that step back and just talk about the, cham the Dutchess County Regional Chamber of Commerce overall and some of the benefits of chamber membership. So, um, I think the best way to illustrate beyond talking about the power of networking locally and getting to know people and maybe being on a committee where you're with like-minded people is the fact that um, right now I'm working on a campaign and when I thought about who can help me with this, who can help me achieve my goals, pretty much everyone on my list are people who I know through the chamber. So I met them at events, I've gotten to know them, some of them are actually on this committee, um, but it's, it's just a really great resource where you feel like you're part of a business network, but it's a lot more than that. So I just wanted to encourage anyone who is not a chamber member to look into it at dcrcoc.org. And I'm sure Rich will mention a little bit about that at the end. Thank you again to our generous sponsors, Stephen Jones from Thrive and Financial and Cindy Smith of Cindy Smith CPA. And thank you to Rich and John at the chamber who are acting as our liaisons, really helping the committee continue through the pandemic so that we could bring offerings like this to you over the past six months. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rich for closing remarks, but again, thank you for your participation. Please um, keep commenting in the chat box because we will share that with the broader committee. And um, for anyone who does have to drop off after Rich, thank you so much for participating. Rich, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jennifer, and, and thank you very much um, uh, for those nice words. Um, just um, quickly so everybody knows, these events uh, typically are open to chamber members only. It's a benefit of chamber membership, um, and, and um, we can't do anything. We can't survive, uh, frankly, without the support of our members uh, and our sponsors. And so um, uh, we encourage you, if you're not a member of the chamber and you've enjoyed this presentation, please do uh, consider uh, the benefits of chamber membership. It's not a large investment, uh, and, and uh, we, I promise you'll get more out of it um, than, uh, than you're putting into it in terms of a, of, of a uh, monetary investment. Um, we have many, many benefits of membership for nonprofit organizations, for businesses, um, and we're happy to uh, speak with you about that. Um, but do please know that, that we did open up this event specifically to non-members, and um, that is not something that we would typically do. So if you're enjoying these resources, if there is something here uh, that, that can help you and your organization, uh, and you're not a member of the chamber, please do let us know. I want to um, quickly uh, echo what Jennifer said to thank Sally uh, and her team, Gabriella and Serena, for joining us this morning and providing uh, this resource. Um, very, very valuable information, and I could tell by all the questions and all the in interactivity um, that it, it is very useful uh, to many of you, if not all of you. Um, thank you again to Jennifer and the committee. This uh, nonprofit committee has been working very hard straight through the pandemic, meeting on a regular basis uh, to help us at the chamber um, provide resources to the nonprofit community throughout the Hudson Valley. And so Jennifer and, and the rest of the committee, um, we want to thank you for that dedication. And uh, one more thank you to Cindy and Steve uh, for helping to sponsor this event. As I mentioned just a, a moment or so ago, we can't do events like this that are complimentary to you to get this these resources 
without the support of our sponsors, without the support of our members. So thank you for Cindy and Steve. This is not a one-time uh, deal for them. They've been supporting the chamber for many, many years um, with their knowledge, their expertise, and also helping to, uh, to present events like this. Many events on the chamber calendar, hopefully that you can take advantage of. Frank mentioned a lot of them earlier. Please do go to our website, dcrcoc.org for more information. Let us know how we can help you. Um, let us know uh, things you may be interested in. Um, there's a lot more to the chamber um, than just uh, the breakfast that we do on a monthly basis and the ribbon cuttings that you may see in the paper. Uh, we're, we're quite a, a large, vibrant organization with many, many resources uh, that I'm sure we can help you with. So with that, um, Gabriella, any, anything uh, in the chat that you want to jump in with? Um. You know, just, just kudos, thank yous to everyone, uh, loving the information, loving these virtual presentations and hoping that they continue once the pandemic is over. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you once again, everyone. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your day, be safe, be well, and we hope to see you in person very soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye all. Thanks, Allie. Thanks everyone.